Videos like this are made possible by the generous support of patrons like F22 Raptor. Thanks F22. Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. We've had a little break as I was off traveling, enjoying my summer, god forbid, but now we're ending 1967 with another flight of our KIG-25, which was debuted in the previous episode. Now, I had a couple of comments pointing out a few small inaccuracies in the design, which I have since fixed. The main one being that the elevators are actually all moving. They don't have a separate control surface like how I'd modeled them. That obviously isn't apparent in static images of the MiG-25, so thank you to those of you who pointed that out. It was actually bizarrely time-consuming to change, though. You'll see that this particular flight is being piloted by Yuri instead of Andre because Andre is still recovering from the previous flight. Kerbals do have a little bit of downtime they need in between missions. Making the elevators all moving took ages to do because for some reason, even though they're exactly the same shape as the previous wing and control surface combo, Ferrum Aerospace Research, the mod which completely overhauls the aerodynamics of the game, models it completely differently. And so the aircraft suddenly became wildly unstable. It took me about two hours to tweak the wing positions, the center of mass, etc., and get it stable again. I had to tweak lots of small elements of the aircraft, but it actually ended up being even more accurate to the real design. You'll notice that the wings are a little bit further back. The angle of those rudders has also changed. So we're just doing a pretty short shakedown flight here. This is Yuri's first time flying the KIG-25 just to get that last little bit of supersonic flight data before we can then re-equip this with the Mach 2 flight experiment. We are tempting fate a little bit here. Some of you may know that Yuri Gagarin, the obvious namesake of Yuri Kerman, was actually killed in March 1968 flying a MiG-15, only five weeks after being allowed to fly again after he was grounded following Soyuz 1 accident. So flying Yuri around in an aircraft quite so close to the date at which his namesake was killed on a routine flight of a MiG is, as I say, tempting fate perhaps, but the flight goes off without a hitch and we come in for a landing. Unfortunately, there's a strange bug in the model of this particular runway static where it's covered in invisible bits of geometry, which we can justify as the runway being improperly cleared after a previous flight. And unfortunately, we hit a couple of these in short succession, which promptly yaw the aircraft, flip it, and thankfully, we don't repeat history. Art not quite imitating life this time, but that's that's not going to buff out. Andre is not going to be happy with what Yuri has done to his treasured new aircraft. Thankfully, they're made of stainless steel and pretty cheap to replace. Now, heading into 1968, our intelligence analysts have poured over the film we returned from our Almaz spy satellites in the previous episode, and they found some curious activity in the Inner Mongolia region of China. It looks like the beginnings of an orbital capable launch site. Yes, China is joining the space race. Those of you that haven't seen, Calvin McClure is going to be joining with his first episode, hopefully, next weekend. So stay tuned, head over to his channel and go subscribe ready for that and watch his teaser if you haven't already. Now heading into February 1968, we've built a new KIG-25 with the crucial improvement of a drag parachute. Just noticing now I probably should have changed the number on the side of the aircraft, but <laughs> nevertheless, I'm not sure why I didn't equip one in the first place. The MiG-25 did actually rely on a drag parachute, and we've proven with our car plane program that they're really, really useful for performing safe landings in which you don't smear the pilot across the runway. I really do wish that we'd had the ejector seat mod back in those days. Of course, some of you may remember Nina getting splattered, which wasn't particularly pleasant, but as I say, these aircraft are actually pretty cheap to replace, even if the pilots are not. So Andre is able to take this new KIG-25 out for a spin and complete the same experiment that Yuri did, this time hopefully bringing it back in one piece. The co 
cockpit piece contains the sample of the science experiment, so since that was completely smashed, we actually lost all the scientific data. So we have to do yet another flight before we can swap the experiment to a Mach 2 flight experiment, which we will be performing in the next episode. Andre now returning back to Blasetsk for hopefully a less eventful landing. Some of you have pointed out that Andre, of course, being our experimental aircraft pilot, has never actually gone into space. And that's a very fair point, but I'm really determined to keep Andre to flying experimental aircraft or space planes. And that's a crucial distinction because I've actually got him earmarked for being the first pilot of the Spiral space plane, but that's actually dependent, even though we have unlocked the part, on the Spiral getting a few more tweaks in the mod development department. The HL20 mod, which it's based on, is a heavy work in progress as is, so Yoshi and some others on the Discord are actually helping me turn that into a fully fledged spiral model with a few crucial differences to the HL20. So we'll launch Andre into space on one of those as and when that's ready. You see here the drag parachute working as intended even though we do hit a few more of those invisible pieces of geometry or pieces of debris from previous aircraft I suppose you can imagine them as we do come to a complete stop. Heading back over to Baikonur, we can see that the Rodner 10 N2 is complete. The final N-Class rocket, which we won't actually be immediately rolling out to the launch pad. We're saving that launch pad for the UR-700 launch of our Lunar TKS spacecraft, but that will be in the next episode. For now, we're attempting to launch Zatminye once again. If you cast your mind back to a couple of episodes ago, this is our Lunar space station, which is Pretty important if we want somewhere for that Lunar TKS to actually travel to. Launching from Abla Cosmodrome, where we put all of our most toxic and horrendous launch vehicles with that beautiful Mountain Dew colored pentaborane plume as before. Lots of memes about drinking pentaborane. I hope this day's memes, please, please do not actually drink pentaborane. It is exceedingly toxic and will cause your lungs to spontaneously combust on contact. Heading back to Zatminye though, last time it failed because of the third stage engines, those RD0216 engines, which are actually derivatives of the UR100 first stage engines and were planned to be used on the LK700 lunar lander. Now we will be actually designing the LK700 at some point to launch atop the UR700, but Lunar TKS visiting this space station is going to be the first step and the first test of the UR700 before we move on to direct descent lunar landing missions in future. We're still closing out those phase two lunar landings with Rodana 10, so we don't have a pressing need for the LK700 just yet. Now we're getting to that crucial point where the last launch fails. Of course, we have those three engines on those radial tanks. So if one of them fails, the rest of them exert way too big a turning moment for the others to overcome. But thankfully, all of the engines ignite successfully and we're on our way into orbit. A few people mentioned perhaps I could angle the nozzles of those outer engines such that you could survive a failure. But if all the engines perform nominally, you are wasting a truly colossal amount of delta V on cosine losses there. Yes, you could survive an engine out, but you'd lose so much delta V doing that, not to mention that the center of mass is changing as the propellant is being consumed, and so you'd need to expend a ridiculous amount of RCS or probably even stronger thrusters compensating for that. It just doesn't end up being economical. It's better to take the risk and have a much lighter launch vehicle than wasting that much fuel in an upper stage like this. Now, this actually took a long time to get into orbit. I wasted an entire day simulating Zadminye, and you might be a bit confused about that since, well, I designed and launched it before. But that's because 
In between then and now, I've created the station science update for the mod pack, introducing a new science experiment which creates a trickle of science from any space station with a scientist on board in low orbit, high orbit, or landed on the surface. And it turns out there was a bug in that that was adding five tons to every single part that the experiment could be equipped to. I did a couple of sims just to make sure I still remembered the launch trajectory correctly since the third stage is quite low thrust as you can see here and it just couldn't get anywhere close to orbit. It took a whole day to actually track down what was causing that. Turned out it was a bug in Kerbalism itself rather than anything I'd written so I had to create a little bit of a creative workaround for it that actually adjusts the mass of the underlying part to compensate since for some reason the science sample mass is added to the part regardless of whether you actually equip the experiment. Now, miraculously five tons lighter, Zat Minye makes it into low Earth orbit, and we target Skylab as we begin our translunar injection. Biddy, why are you targeting Skylab? What are you up to? Well, we're going to put it into the same inclination orbit as Skylab. For much the same reason, we'll probably eventually build our moon bases close to one another to keep an eye on each other and because it opens up all sorts of possibilities for shenanigans. Of course, our pragmatic reason is just in case something goes wrong on either space station, it's very efficient to get from one space station to the other. No need to head back to Earth, you can use a small shuttle or even potentially use an EVA pack to get from one to the other. They will be that efficient to travel between. The real reason is, of course, we want to do Cold War Black Ops stuff. And I'll save the particular details of that for the next episode, but if you remember, N9 left Skylab uncrewed for a while since he had some problems with his Cat and 5 production line, and we are going to take full advantage of that. I'd love to see some theories as to what people think we're going to be doing, but trust me, it's going to be great. No, we're not going to blow it out the sky, that would cause an international incident, but don't you worry, we've got something pretty hilarious planned. Now heading straight on out to Cislunar Space without any problems. We're now performing our injection burn, not quite going into a circular orbit yet. We're going into the most eccentric orbit around the moon we can manage, which allows our inclination change to be the most efficient it can be. And it turns out we calculated the delta V margins of this down to the wire. We are going to be left with just enough delta V to manage this, even having to use a little bit of the station's onboard propellant. I'm glad that I actually drained all of the life support resources out of the station just before I launched it, realizing that I wouldn't really need them since Luna TKS carries all the life support it needs for the mission and I might value having the wiggle room of that extra Delta V that provides me. And yeah, I'm really glad I did that. Speaking of Luna TKS, which you'll be seeing in the next episode, I did do a poll on the Discord as for a few names I might give it since Luna TKS is a bit clunky and really just the designation for the spacecraft before it was given an apt name like Soyuz, Vostok, Voskhod, etc were and I promptly ignored the results of the poll because a native Russian speaker intervened and said that the one that you all chose was bad and I ended up going for Zakat which means sunset and that kind of pairs nicely with Zatminye, which of course means eclipse, sunset into eclipse. I thought that was pretty cool. And it pairs really well with Rasviet, which means dawn, which of course is the name of one of the modules of the International Space Station, but it is also going to be the name of the low Earth orbit variant of TKS, which we'll be using in future to service our Salyut stations. But now after firing its onboard thrusters to circularize its orbit, Zat Minye quietly awaits the crew of Zakat-1.
and for the rest of the episode we're heading back out to deep space to rejoin Phobos Grunt. Now we left this in an eccentric orbit of Mars, gathering all the scientific data it could from high orbit, low orbit, and even skimming the upper atmosphere of the red planet. But now it's got all the data it can, it's time for it to head to, well, the namesake of the mission, Phobos. We're going to land on the surface and get that all-important surface sample ahead of the Mars Earth transfer window later this year. It's actually rapidly approaching. Some of these science experiments take a really long time to do, so we're going to be pretty hard-pressed to get everything done, not only on the surface of Phobos, but also in low orbit around it. We might end up having to leave some of those low orbit experiments just unfinished and reperform them in a future mission. But those surface samples, those are the crucial element of this mission. We've already, of course, grabbed one from Deimos, so now we need to get this one from Phobos, ready to send them both back to Earth when we hit that transfer window. Now, it doesn't require a huge amount of Delta V to rendezvous with Phobos, but you do have to treat rendezvousing with these small rubble pile moons as if you're intercepting a spacecraft. Their gravity really is that pathetic. And we now descend very, very gently towards the surface. So gently, in fact, that the surface is actually rotating underneath us at exactly the same speed we're falling at, which does look a little bit curious. After a brief eclipse of the sun by Mars, we decide to head down into this particular crater. As it looks reasonably interesting, and there are some flat patches in the terrain surrounding it. Getting a flat patch of terrain, of course, isn't crucial. The gravity is so weak we could land at like a 60 degree angle very comfortably, but it does look a little better and exposes our solar panels to the sun for more of the moon's orbit. Deimos Grunt is having some power problems. It's taking a while to complete particularly the mass spectrometry experiment because of course for half of the orbit of Deimos it's not in sunlight. So it's just having to do its experiments as and when its solar panels are exposed. But regardless, we see a nice little flat patch of terrain just up a bit from the initial landing site we were going for, so after readjusting, we head back in for a landing. Descending towards the surface at a measly half a meter per second, I do actually accelerate briefly just to get down to the ground a bit faster, and then continue down at half a meter per second because any slower and that ground anchor might not actually lock into the surface properly. But thankfully, we touch down and grab into the surface of the moon without any problems. Not the first spacecraft to land on Phobos, the same as with Deimos, the Americans beat us to it. Not with a purpose-designed lander, of course, they just had some Delta V left on an orbiter and decided they might as well touch down on the moons of Mars while they were there. But we are the first dedicated lander to touch down on the surface and the first to take a surface sample. Of course, will be the first return surface samples from beyond the sphere of influence of the Earth as well. So very exciting pair of missions, which we'll be returning to in future episodes. As I said, I took a little hiatus because I was off traveling, but we should be back to reasonably regular uploads again with shortish episodes like this one. I'm keeping them a little bit more focused, a little bit more concise. I know some people complained on the previous episode that it was shorter than they used to. It didn't contain quite as much stuff. But think about it this way. I edit and release these videos as soon as I have all the footage you see in them. If I aimed for a longer video with more stuff in it, that would just take longer to release. Most of you responded pretty positively to these more frequent, more focused episodes. So I think this is the format. Sub 20 minute episodes focusing on just a handful of key missions. Go subscribe to Calvin McClure if you haven't already and join me in eagerly awaiting the first episode of China joining the series. Thanks for watching everyone, I've been the Beardy Penguin and I will see you all next time. A massive thank you to my patrons for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the Amazing Steak, Peter Lushtonets, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Lady Lagsalot, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Jordan Millward, Luna Nicole the Fox, Frosty Moon, Mr. Blue Star, F22 Raptor, and Antonator00.